uh, Professor Zakir Naik, and many of you who are from this community recognize him if they have listened to his Kurba and have been in his company, they will know who he is. Brother Naik is from Hyderabad. He is a full time Dawa worker. Brother Naik is an Islamic scholar and also is the president of Islamic Research Foundation. So, Brother Naik will say the Kurba and then perform the Nikah Seven. Thank you, sir. It's a pleasure for me to deliver the Qurba of the Nikah of my dear friend, Mr. Sabi Ahmad. And I'll ask you to speak a few minutes on the importance of marriage, of Nikah. Nikah is an Arabic word which means it's called as a misah, a sacred covenant. And it is an agreement, a contract between the man and the woman. It is a sacred covenant, and the same word is used in the Quran, Exodus Asar, chapter 33, verse number 7, where a covenant, an agreement, is given by the Prophet to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that they deliver the message. And the same word is used in Surah Nisa chapter number 4, verse number 21, to describe marriage, to describe nikah as a misah, as a sacred covenant. And unlike other religions, which consider the woman as an instrument of the devil, the glorious Quran calls the woman as a moksena, as a fortress against the devil. And the nikah is also referred to as a hiss, that's a fortress. And a pious woman, she sees to it that she keeps the husband on the Sarat al Mustaqim. Therefore, she is referred as a moksena, as a fortress against the devil. And in Islam, there is no monasticism. Our beloved Prophet said, there is no service in Islam. And the Prophet Muhammad said, as mentioned in Sayyid Al-Khali, volume number 7, in the book of Nikah, chapter number 3, hadith number 4, the Prophet said, O oh young people, whoever has the means to get married should get married. And the Prophet said, it's again mentioned in Sayyid Al-Khali, that marriage is my sunnah, it's my way of life. And anyone who does not marry is not of me. That's the reason that certain scholars will say that Nikah is what, while others say it's a sunnah or it's mustahab, it's entrenched. And the Prophet also said that marriage completes half your being. One clear question after time, somebody asked me, that does it mean that if I marry twice, I complete my full being? What the Prophet when he said marriage completes half your being? What the Prophet meant was that marriage prevents you from fornication, from promiscuity, from homosexuality, which are half the evil in the society. Only if you marry do you have an opportunity to be a husband or a wife. Only if you marry do you have an opportunity to be a father or a mother, which are very important to in Islam. So irrespective of whether you marry once or twice, you only complete half your being. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran, in Surah Rum, chapter 30, verse number 21, Allah says, And amongst his signs, he hath made for you mates from amongst yourself, so that you may dwell in him with tranquility. And he has put mercy and love between your hearts. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says 
that he has put love and mercy between the hearts of the man and woman. This love which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks is unlike the love which the non-Muslims have between the man and the woman, more of a lust. Here the love which Allah talks is somewhat like a covenant. That means love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is the the love of our spouses. And there are certain criteria for the fulfillment of an account. And one of them is that the permission of both the would be husband and wife, man and woman, is equally important. And it's mentioned in Bukhari, volume number 7, in the book of Nikah, chapter number 49, hadith number 63, that once a woman by the name of Hansa Mikhail and Ansariya, she approached the Prophet and said, that I have been forced by my father to marry a man who I did not like, and the Prophet never tried to marry. The permission of both man and woman, would be husband and wife, is equally important for marriage to some nice. And the other important aspect is the mahal. And our young Kali, he recited the verse of the Quran from Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 4, we say, give to the woman a marital gift in the world. That means a mahal is compulsory for a marriage to Sauron in Islam. The country where I come from, India, and from where many of us come, India and Pakistan, there, the Indian culture is often with, it is the woman who gives the dowry to the would-be husband. And depending upon the status of the husband, if he's a graduate, they demand 100,000 rupees, an engineer, he demands 500,000 rupees. If the doctor, it's 1 million rupees. As they're selling herds and cattle in the marketplace. In Islam, it's the opposite. It is the would-be husband, the man, who gives the mahal, the dower, to the would-be wife, the woman. Demanding dowry from the would-be wife, directly or indirectly, is prohibited in Islam. But unfortunately, many of the Muslims are following the same Indian culture. And even we, unfortunately, demand dowry. We just a nominal amount of mahal, like in India they give 786 rupees, 151 rupees. You can't even buy a pair of shoes with that amount. And they spend extra money on the marriage. And they indirectly demand dowry from the would-be wife. For example, the father of the group may say to the wife that my son likes to travel in a Mercedes car, indicating he wants a Mercedes car in dowry. My son likes to live in a four bedroom apartment, indicating that he wants a four bedroom apartment in dowry. Directly or indirectly demanding dowry from the would be wife is private in Islam. If willingly the parents of the bride give some gifts, Alhamdulillah. But demanding directly or indirectly from the would be wife is private. In fact, it is the groom who gives to the would be wife. And, as I said, that the woman, the wife, is a moxana, a fortress against the devil. That's the reason I beloved Prophet Muhammad is mentioned in Sayyid Bukhari, he said, that when you choose your life partner, normally a human being looks for four things. One is beauty, second is wealth, third is mobility, and fourth is virtue. And amongst all of this, the best is virtue. And those who choose a life partner because of virtue, inshallah, they will prosper in life. And there are various other hadith in Sahih Bukhari and other books of hadith that virtue is the main criteria that you should look for while choosing a life partner. And in Islam, unlike the non-Muslims, we do not call our women folk as housewives because if you analyze the word housewife, she is not married to the house we call the housewife. We prefer calling them as homemakers because they build the home. They make the home. And that's the reason the woman is respected in Islam because of the mother. And there's a hadith in Sayyid Bukhari, what's in the book of Adab, chapter 2, 
hadith number two, when a person approaches the Prophet and asks him that who deserves the maximum love and companionship in this world? And the Prophet said, your mother. The man asked, who next? The Prophet again said, your mother. The man asked after that too. Again the Prophet said, your mother. The man asked after that too. Then the Prophet said, your father. In short, three fourth of the love and companionship goes to the mother. One fourth goes to the father. Seventy-five percent of companionship goes to the mother. Twenty-five percent to the father. In short, the mother gets the gold medal, she gets the silver medal, as well as the bronze medal. The father has to be satisfied with the mere consolation prize. Because the mother bears the child in a womb for nine months, that the reason she gives respect. Pregnancy uplifts a woman. And today in society, the parents normally, they're concerned about the children. That what will happen to our children, especially in the Western countries, and in particular in the US. We see the atmosphere around us, the surrounding around us. We are afraid that our children will fall into bad hands. There will be wrong habits. And we see that many a time the people in the Western countries, they put them in public school and later on when they find that the children have been addicted to drugs, they have picked up haram habits, then they put them in Islam school. It's a requirement that we should have more Islamic schools in the society. But we should plan about the life of our children. How we should upbring them much more earlier. Not when they learn bad habits in high school, to take them out and put them into an Islamic school. We should plan that our children are brought up Islamically at an early stage. I mean, can anyone tell me when is the best time to plan? Can anyone guess which is the best time to best time to plan that our children will be brought up Islamically? How early can you plan? Can anyone give an answer? How early can you plan? Not in high school. How early? Or don't you have plan that you should bring your children Islamically? Don't you have plan that your children should become good Muslims? Or do you want the society to see to it that they drift their children away from Islam? No one has any answers? How early should we plan? Sorry? Before the child is born. During pregnancy. The brother said, MashaAllah, it's a very good answer here, that before the child is born, the moment you're pregnant, the, the lady is pregnant, you should plan how Islamically should bring up the child. And that was the same answer given to me last time when I asked this question to the audience. Someone said, when you put him in school at the age of two, someone said, and the best answer was, I got from the audience was, when the child is conceived in the womb of the mother. But that is not the best answer about Islam. In Islam, you plan to upbring your child Islamically when you choose your life partner. It is not when you conceive the child. You choose your life partner, Islamic life partner, then only can you upbring your children Islamically. If you don't have an Islamic life partner, that is the reason the Prophet Muhammad said that you should choose a virtuous life partner. It's far superior than beauty, wealth and nobility. Virtuous life partners. Well, if you have a virtuous life partner, then only can you really upbring your children in the true Islamic fashion. And, Alhamdulillah, I'm told that this couple that will be married, Brother Sabina and Sister Asma, MashaAllah, that both of them are virtuous. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may He grant them happy and prosperous and Islamic aligned life. And I start my talk by quoting a verse in the Lord's Quran from Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 1, they say, Ya you are nasu taqorabu Allah bi khalabu bin nafsi khalaka min haa tawja Which means, O oh, humankind, reference your guardian God who has created you from a single person and created like nature his mate. And from them, there are countless men and women who have been And Allah says in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, 
in the Lord that it be all humankind that created you from a single pair of men and women. And have divided you into nations and tribes so that you may recognize each other, not that you may despise each other. And the most honored in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the person who has taqwa. The criteria for judgment in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not sex, it's not wealth, it's not color, it's not caste, it's not creed, but it is taqwa. It is righteousness, it is God consciousness. It is piety. And I would like to end my talk by giving the quotation of the Guru's Quran from Surah Bakra chapter number 2, verse number 87, which says, Hunna libasul lakum wa antum libasul lakum. That they are your garments, your wives are your garments, and you are their garments. That means the role of husband and wife should be that of garments. The garment conceals the bodies of a person, beautify one another. It is a relationship of hands and blood.